There is nothing like the love of God, is there? This morning we're speaking about new renditions, changed definitions, and progressive interpretation. Now why I've chosen that title, I was looking at all the different translations of the Bible. My goodness, there are so many. Which is the true one? What's the true one? Yes. What's the, there's so many fake ones. Which one should I be reading? King James. Okay. Now I know others choose the New English Version. Some of them say, well, we should do the Trucker's Edition. That's the New International Version. There's a A Bible. There's the Catholic Bible. There's a New Living Translation. It's, you ever, if you just went to look at translations of the Bible, that's about two pages full. So what happens when people don't like necessarily what one says? The King James had been around since 1611. That's closer to, than most of them, right? And I can tell you something else. All major works of the Bible are based on King James. If you look for the definition of words, they will come primarily from the King James edition of the Scripture. So, what a morning. 16th of October already. Are you ready for Thanksgiving? My good. It's going to cost a little bit more for old turkey, isn't it? My goodness, I just noticed the price of eggs. Do any of you mean do the shopping? Yeah, that's us, Fred. Boy, things have changed. But aren't you grateful you get food? And aren't you even more thankful that you're not eating manna every day? Hey, right, that's tough. Well, I want you to go with me through these next few verses. Because it's exciting. Notice it says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knows us not, because it knew him not. Well, if you don't know our Father, how would you know the Son? And the world does not know God the Father, so how would they expect to know us? You see, we're not the world. We're not even part of this world. We're only in it. But we're to be glorifying Jesus, and there should be such a radiance of gratitude in each of us for what God has given us the privilege to be. Now just think of what we were before we were sons of God. We were enemies in our mind toward God. We were of an evil heart. We were sinners. We were alienated. We were malicious. We were hateful. And we hated one another. That's the nature of the world. But after that, the love and kindness of God toward men appeared. But not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. Right. And the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. That's what changed our life. We didn't change it because we decided one day, I need to make a change. It was whenever He came and said, you must change. I can't change myself. How many of you ever tried changing yourself? Reforming yourself? Forget about it. It doesn't work. That's why it's so foolish for a, a man or woman to try to change their wife or husband. By the way, if you didn't get it done before marriage, you'll never get it done after marriage. I know you haven't. Yeah, I know you're just laughing at me. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Does that mean now? Would you think a son of God would be something like his father? What do you think? 
Do you think he would be a lot like his father? Should we emulate our father? Should our behavior, our words, deeds, thoughts be like our fathers? I mean, if we are sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, because we're going to see him as he is. And the reason is because we're his sons, and we're going to lay aside the earthly body. And may I say to you, the earthly body is in the Greek called soma. The body in itself is not evil. The body is not sinful. It's the body. It gets the command either from the spirit or soul or something else. And we should celebrate our body. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Would you agree? That's got to be a pretty holy thing then, doesn't it? He said, I, preserve, I pray that God will preserve <coughs> our whole spirit, soul, and body until. But I want you to notice these first two scriptures say that you're sons of God. And that's including women. <coughs> sons of God. You know, it's the first time John mentions that. He doesn't mention it in chapter 1. He doesn't mention it in chapter 2. He calls them his little children. Until we get to chapter 3. And everything changes. Does anyone happen to know about John 1, 9? 1 John 1, 9? Anybody know that scripture? Hmm? Why do we know that scripture so well? Because we've been taught to say it. Every day. Matter of fact, I saw Cardinal Dolan of St. Pat's Church in New York City. And I went to visit that church, and it was quite interesting to me. It's not as huge as I thought it would be. But they have statues around the building. And while I was there, I saw people just, I mean, laying out before the statues. And I'm like, wow. You know what I'm saying, John? And I walked in and I'm thinking, what's come over there? I mean, you just see them laying down like they've been slain in the Holy Ghost. And then I watched Cardinal Dolan during COVID because they didn't have church, so they had them every morning on computer. And he would say this, I'm paraphrasing, but it's close. He put his hand on his heart. I have seen, I have sinned grievously against you, Father. I've sinned against you, Son, and Holy Spirit. I have grieved you with my sin. <clears throat> my brothers and my sisters, I have sinned against you. Oh my God, would you forgive me? Of my transgressions. Well, the first time I saw that, I said, well, he's, he's having a bad day. Then I watched him the second day, and it was the same prayer. And I watched him the third day, and it was the same prayer. I watched the fourth day, and there was a different priest, but the same prayer. I watched the fifth day, and I said, this is enough. I'm not a Catholic. I can't take this anymore. Can you imagine before every service you're going to hear the Cardinal of the Catholic Church talk about how he has sinned against God? Folks, that's anathema. And if you don't believe it, just follow these scriptures. And then tell me what you think. Because we are to expect with confidence and anticipate with pleasure that's hope. Every man that has this hope of what? Of seeing Jesus, of being with him forever. He purifies himself even as he is pure. 
And you say, well, how do you get pure? We must continue yielding to the Holy Spirit and His love. That's the key to purity. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And that's what John said. We're going to see Him. Because we're going to be like Him. We're sons of God now. Today. This day. Don't you think that's a wonderful and glorious honor? Yes. What else could be greater than being a son of God? Tell me. What about the son of the Kennedys? Rockefellers? Or all the... Get the richest person in all the world. You know, if I was a young person, I don't want to be a son of Elon Musk. I want to be a son of God. And this is what Paul says the end of our commandment is love from a pure heart, clean conscience, and a sincere faith. Our sons of God under the law. <clears throat> if we are, we're in trouble. Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So what is sin? Do you believe that's sin? Hello? But you won't read that aloud with me. Whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. Do you believe that Sodom and Gomorrah violated law? Of course, God made man and woman. And he said they shall be one flesh. Well, Sodom and Gomorrah didn't follow that. What about America? I have to ask you today. Have you not read even at Vanderbilt? Vanderbilt. The great college in Tennessee, Vanderbilt. Where they were performing these sex change surgeries for children. Little girls having mastectomies. And boys being changed so they could be a girl, I mean literally, surgically. And then giving them blockers, puberty blockers. And parents didn't even know it. What do you mean they didn't know it? Schools promoting it. Folks. This is egregious. Do you think? Oh, yeah. Commit a sin transgresses also the law. For sin is a transgression of the law. Remember when John wrote verse 9? And he talks about confessing our sin. And in the confessing of our sin, he cleanses us by the blood. And not only that, he gives us righteousness, but that's in chapter 1, verse 9. Do you ever read a book and just read one part of the book, one sentence, and you close the book and you got it? Of course not. <laughs> so let's go to the next verse. What Jesus did is never enough for some theologians. And you know that he was manifested, revealed, to what? Do you believe that? Absolutely. And in him is what? Do you think Jesus is under the law? No. Do you think he fulfilled the law? Yes. Well, we ought to be grateful for that, shouldn't we? Yes. But I want to tell you something. That's never enough for theologians. That's never enough for many pastors. Because we've all been taught out of the same book. Beware of deceivers. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. Now, how do we see that playing out in Scripture? Well, Paul said, He who knew no sin was made sin for us. Isn't that wonderful? Aren't you glad he took your sins? He was made... 
He wasn't a sinner, was he? Jesus Christ never sinned. He was sinless. But he, he was made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. Isn't that fabulous? There's not everybody that doesn't believe that. A lot of preachers, a lot of theologians don't believe that. Did you know? We got something happening here. There we go. So how dare John to violate 1 John 1.90? And 1 9, he's telling us, confess your sins. And he will cleanse you from your sins. And from all unrighteousness. But now notice this one. John's turning away from that completely. And it blows their mind. He that committeth. I, I missed some. We got to go back here. Verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him, what? You don't believe that, do you? We haven't been taught that in our life. Hmm? Have we? Come on, tell the truth. Whosoever abides in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, no comprehension of him, neither knowing him. Does that sound like a total change from 1 John 1 9? What do you say? Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is. Oh, that just can't be true, can it? He that committed sin is of the devil. I read a commentary of a man saying, I know I'm not of the devil, but I know I sin every day. And I said to myself, then you're of the devil. No, I, I mean, I'm going to tell you, you want to get an argument, don't, don't try it. Just, 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 just share a scripture. He that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God, our premier example as we sons of God, was manifested, revealed that he might destroy the works of the devil. He that committed sin is of the devil. How does that line up with 1 John chapter 1? How can this be biblically accurate? Look at this one. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. Let's go back just for a moment and, and give you a little relaxation. The whole focus is after verse 4 of 1 John 3. Sin is a transgression of the law. He's taken us from the law, placing us in Christ under grace. Right. He doesn't use grace because Paul's the master of understanding grace. They didn't grasp that like Paul did. Matter of fact, the things that Paul wrote, Peter said sometimes are hard to be understood. But now you're a son of God. It's not that you're just walking in the light. You're sons of God now. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. I can't commit sin if I'm not under the law. And we'll have to find out how do you get from not being under the law. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin. 
Did you read that? I said, did you read that? His seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he's born of God. So it should bring us to a place to say, oh God, help me. I want, I want to share with you a major theologian's statement. And this is, these are his words. And I have them written, I can share them with you, I'm just quoting him. In this instant, John says, if it is not possible for those who are really born again to sin, there must be very few genuine Christians. But why is that? Because in his position, he's a sinner saved by grace. He's still a sinner. How do you remain a sinner? By remaining under the law. Look at this next statement. Oh, this, this is the one that just kills me. Man still possesses a fallen sin nature as well as the indwelling Holy Spirit. Have you ever heard the term schizophrenic? Yeah. I mean, can you imagine there's two of you living at the same time? One good, one bad, one evil, and one righteous. And sometimes people say, well, if you only knew what I knew. No. Can you see that? I mean, this is like a total split personality. Fallen nature, as well as indwelling Holy Spirit. He said the correct translation of 1 John 3 should be the one who practices sin. Now, did you notice what he says? He says what it should be. Well, he says... I know more than John knows, and it should be. The one who practices sin, not the one who cannot sin. Are you with me? Does that get your attention? In other words, the Bible is not really the authority, so you know what they did, don't you? They changed some translations to accommodate that. I have a question. Well, let, let, let me just give you this first. This is, Logan is our informant. He's our informant. He knows. He writes the expression, he cannot sin, simply means the true believer cannot habitually, deliberately, easily, and maliciously sin. He, it simply means, is that what you read earlier? Is that the same as cannot? In other words, you can sin, but just don't do it habit formingly. In other words, just don't have a habit of it. And don't do it deliberately. And whatever you do, don't do it easily. And for Jesus' sake, please don't be malicious in your sin. Because I ask myself this question. Then what if I sin once a day but I don't practice it? I just do it in the morning from 9 to 12. But I don't practice it all day. So it's not really a habit. And certainly I'm not doing it easily. Because I struggle with it but I still do it. And I'm not malicious trying to get even with somebody that's been bad to me. Do you understand this is the typical position of theologians? Do you hear me today? And if you'll hear preachers, I, I, I have to ask myself, that if it's habitually and it's not habitually, just say it's, how often do you want to say it? Once every other day? And what sin is it? But we treat some sins worse than others, don't we? Is adultery treated worse than others? Well, why is that? Because if we violate one, we violate them all, don't we? Do we read that somewhere? 
or somebody steals money. It's amazing, isn't it? So I mean, yeah, just give me this one more point. As long as I don't habitually kill someone, let's just say I only kill a few. You see, when a person writes stuff like this, there's no end to where it goes. And can you realize then why people say, I'm a sinner saved by grace? Huh? Of course. Let's read the Amplified Bible. Let's see what it has to say. No one born begotten of God deliberately knowing it. Can you imagine you didn't even know it? And habitually practice the sin. For God's nature abides in him. So God's nature abides in me, so I don't do it knowingly. I don't do it deliberately. I don't do it habitually, but I do it often. I, it's not that I practice every day like I do basketball when I was a kid. I just do it every other day. I wouldn't call that a practice, would you? For God's nature abides in him. His principal life, the divine sperm, remains perpetual as him, and he cannot practice sinning. You, you need to tell me. You don't even know it. Because he's born of God. Because he's born of God. I'm going to ask you, sir, does that make any sense to you? I mean, just, just the basis of thinking through a process. I'm not talking about inductive reasoning. I'm just saying read it. So deliberately, knowingly, habitually practice for God's nature abides in him. <laughs> Folks, this, this is a crazy world. John states that you are one of two. In this the children of God are manifest in the children of the devil. Whoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. You see, these are the things that are most important to John. He said, either children of the devil or the children of God. The one doesn't do righteousness and he doesn't love his brother. You know what? The so-called church today is full of that. Just, just go down the list of all the churches, that, all the denominations that exist. And then tell me, how many of them are following righteousness of God? Love is God's message, for this is a message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. Hmm. You know, jealousy is a horrible thing. God even spoke to Cain. He said, you didn't bring the right offering. I want a blood sacrifice. And yet, the scripture says, by faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice and Cain by which he became a witness of righteousness. And yet his blood is still speaking. Thank God. What a man. Marvel not, my brother, if the world hate you. You see, if a brother Cain would kill a brother named Abel, and they were the first two sons of the first parents, do you know how you think the world looks at you? And that's why many Christians don't like to speak up. Because I had several people in my life as a Christian say, well, everybody loves me. I said, really? I said, you're not a good witness for Jesus. I said, what do you mean I'm not a good witness? Everybody loves me. I said, you can't be. Because people I found get angry when a person is living for Jesus Christ and glorifying Him and speaking to someone else that you need to repent. Why do people want to repent? I didn't do anything wrong. I'm a good person. 
You ever challenge that? Matter of fact, I want to ask a question. Have you even found today that the world hates people that aren't even Christians but just trying to do the right thing? Huh? Have you seen that? It's amazing, isn't it? It's either you do it our way or it's the highway and we want you out of here. You read about people saying they like to kill so and so. I think, my goodness. And now we're on the edge of Armageddon. The nuclear weapons are about to start shooting from Russia to the U.S. No. How many of you believe that? No. 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 I'm going to tell you. God says that he would shorten the days or no flesh would be saved. You can be sure of one thing. God's the one that will destroy the earth, not Putin or Biden. No man's going to destroy. This isn't their earth to destroy. This is his earth. He created it, didn't he? I sometimes look at people and I think, I'm not concerned about a nuclear weapon. I'm concerned that people don't know Jesus Christ so they can escape the damnation that's coming. And here he's talking about us, how to love. Now we've got a test. How to know we have life. This is it. We know we pass from death to life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in what? What do you think of that test? So, he follows up with, with something more interesting to me. It says, without love, hate is present. Without love, hate is present. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. He just hates. Can I tell you somebody that hates will end up wanting to kill another and if they had the opportunity they would? You know, 80% of all murders are committed between a husband and a wife or a boyfriend and girlfriend. 80%. It's not just someone that you meet on the street. That's not the one going to wipe you out. It's the one you're living with, loving with. Be careful at home. What's that knife? Keep the poison begged up. And you know that no murder has eternal life abiding in him. We know that, don't we? Now he said, as sons are like our father, hereby perceive we the love of God. He laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. That's big time love, isn't it? Have guys ever done that in the military? Have guys ever saved their buddies? When they've fallen on those grenades to save their partner? Greater love has no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friend. Jesus said, I call you friends. And I want you to realize this. Not everybody needs someone to lay down their life. They need them to help them live. So he uses but, the big but. Who has this world's good? And seeth his brother have need. And sheddeth up his bowels of compassion from him. How does the love of God dwell in him? You see, there's the big question. How can we help someone along the way? What can we do to help a brother or sister in Christ? And sometimes people say, well, they didn't manage well. Can I say to you this? Somewhere, sometime in all of our lives, we haven't all managed well. Would you agree with that? So we ought to be giving them a break and say, it doesn't matter. I want to help you. How well is the love of God in him? Hmm. My little children, let us not love in word and tongue, but in deed and truth. The word of truth also accomplishes the deed. The tongue is to speak truth. Now it says test. Our deeds prove word and truth. Hereby we know that we are the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. And this is the process. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Why is it condemning me? Because I'm not loving. 
I'm not loving enough if I see a brother or sister in need and I don't help them. You with me? And then I'll walk away and say, oh, I should have done. Has, has that ever happened to you? You walked away, you saw a need, and you left it, and you did nothing about it, and you're in the car going somewhere, and all of a sudden your heart goes, bam, you should have helped them. Anybody ever? Don't wait for me. If our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and there's all things. We are to love each other. We are to share and serve each other. How to live confidently. Beloved, if our heart condemns us not, then have we confidence toward God. Do you know God will answer every one of our prayers if we do what he tells us? No, he will answer every prayer. Well, and I want you to see this. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because, one, we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. You see those two things? Well, what's his commandment? It's broken up in two parts. The one is we keep his commandment. What's his commandment? That we love each other. And the second is we do those things that are pleasing in his sight. How do I know what's pleasing? Holy Spirit always lets you know if you're following the Word of God. Holy Spirit will never fail us. Will he? Hmm. Oh, this is good. And I, I, I suppose for the most part that we look at this commandment that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ. So we always pray in the name of Jesus, don't we? We believe in His name. You see, I don't think there should ever be a time we don't believe in His name. So that's number one. We believe. And the second is that we love one another as He gave His commandment. And if we do those two things, if I'm going to do this to please Him, and if I'm going to do this out of love and trust in Jesus, God's going to hear my prayer. What do you think? Now, if I start only praying for me, 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 that's another story altogether. We can run away with those prayers. If we got five jets, we need another one. You, ever, you, you read about that? I just need a jet to get me there faster. I need a $35 million jet. That's one of the names I said he needs. So boy, Paul would have been in trouble, wouldn't he? I mean, this guy's on boats, slow boats to China. He didn't say I need a jet. He found out that God does mighty things while he's on the boat. But see, these guys don't read about the boats. They only they want to fly jets. Listen to me. God will put us where we need to be at the time we need to be there. What do you think? <laughs> he's always on time. He's always going to put us in the right place. He that keepeth his commandments dwells in him, and he in him, and hereby we know he abides in us by the Spirit which he has given us. Isn't it wonderful to have the Holy Spirit? Amen. That was one thing I knew when I received Christ. I've got to have the Holy Ghost. I can't know Jesus without the Holy Ghost. I can't be led into anything without the Holy Spirit leading me. I need you, Holy Spirit. And he doesn't boast of himself. He's always talking about the Father and the Son, isn't it? Isn't he wonderful? Okay, let's do this roundup real quick. The Apostle Paul's true insight. So how do we ever get out from under the law? He said, I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. So the first thing that's got to happen, I've got to get out from under the law. Would you agree? How do I do it? I have to be dead to the law. Once I'm dead to the law, the law has no power over me, power over me at all. Now we live unto God. Well, how in the world can that happen? Ah, he answers it. 
I am crucified with Christ. When Christ died, he died to the law. He was buried. That is, he took the sins of the whole world. All that the law said is sin, he took it and had it nailed to his cross. The sins of the whole world. And Paul said, I joined him. I am crucified with Christ. I died to the law. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who what? Loved me and gave himself for me. Do you think God hates sin? Hmm? I do too. And I think to the point that we can receive that. Whoa, 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 whoa. Here's the, here's the following verse in Galatians 2.21. I do not frustrate the grace of God. That is, as an ego, which means to despise and put to no value. Look at what he's saying. I do not frustrate the grace of God for if righteousness come by the law that Christ is dead in vain. How does our righteousness come? He was made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. I had a Bible study. And it was with people who I'm a sinner saved by grace group. And they're lovely people. I mean, I enjoy being with them. Don't, don't get me wrong. And so I was preaching about living for God. And she said, let me point out this scripture to you. So she had to turn to Galatians 5, 17. Now read it. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. Right? And these are contrary the one to another, so that we cannot do the things that we would. You see, there's the schizophrenic. There's the two personalities. Do you see that there? For the flesh lust, and the spirits against the flesh. And that's going on in people's body. Can you imagine how frustrating that's got to be? What do you think? It's a constant battle. And I said, you stopped reading too soon. She said, what do I mean reading too soon? He's talking about the flesh and the spirit. He said, and she said, that's where I am. I'm caught in this thing all the time. And I wish it's about to drive me crazy. I said, ma'am, you quit reading too soon. She said, well, what do you want me to read? So I said, let's go to another verse. What Paul's solution was, they that are Christ. Well, I'll be. We got rid of the problem. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust thereof. Amen. Well, Lord, we should be shouting the roof off this place. Praise God you enable us to crucify that schizophrenic man. That messed up, mixed up personality that just can't get it right. They that are Christ. Now, here's the other thing. Does God hate sin? How many of you believe he does? Yes. Do you believe it? Yes. Can God do all things well? Yes. Does God love you? Yes. Would God allow you to remain what he hates and why Christ died? Answer me that quick, would you please? Would Christ allow you to remain what he hates? Doesn't he hate sin? So he's going to allow you to stay a sinner, the very thing that he hates, and he came down here to deliver us from sin, and yet I'm still a sinner saved by grace? Think about it for a moment. 
You see, I don't need a theological degree to read that and understand it, do you? God's not going to keep you in such a pit if He's able to deliver you. What? Would the Father of Heaven giving you the power to become sons of God keep you in sin, the very thing He hates? He laid on Him the iniquity of us all. What did He hate? He loved righteousness and hated iniquity. And therefore God said, I laid on Him the iniquity, that lawlessness that causes sin in the first place. Well, how, how does all this work? How can I apply this? <laughs> I've learned one thing about people. It's easier to ask forgiveness than to get permission. Did you agree with that? I can't even begin to tell you the number of people that I've talked to and interacted with because of their behavior. And they would say, well, that's no problem. Jesus will forgive me. I said, but the question is, do you love God? Well, of course I love God. Then why do we have this behavior? Maybe, maybe your love just went absent for a moment. Time after time after time, people say to me, if I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me my sins, puts me from all unrighteousness. He's faithful and just to forgive me. Well, wouldn't you not want to do the thing that killed your Savior? Wouldn't we want to avoid doing the thing that he hates and that hurt him so much that he took the beating in his body, he took the nails in his hands and the nails in his feet. He was cursed and spit upon all because he became that curse of sin for you and I. Why would I want to continue doing something that's going to crush him and allow Satan to mock him? Yeah, there's your son down there, old son of life. What do you think of him, God? I, I, I don't understand how anyone can say I'm a sinner saved by grace. Why can't they just say I'm a son of God saved by grace? How can a person sin or transgress the law? If the Son of God is under grace. Well, let's celebrate. Since you have put off the old man. Remember, remember the theologian said, we still have the fallen nature of sin. Remember reading that? So he said, since you have put off the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust. Did any of us ever live with deceitful lust? Were any of us ever corrupt? Yes, I was. And have put on the new man, which after God... Did you see how you're created? After who? Hmm? After sin? Are we, are we still here with sin? Or does it say, you put off the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust? That's the old fallen nature, isn't it? And then put on the new man, which after God, after God, is created. How's he created? What else? Separated to him. The one that loves us. And then the screen goes black. That's about the way it is, isn't it? It just goes black. <laughs> I, I stand amazed to think of all my pastors. They always kept me in first John one nine. I'll just confess my sin. He's faithful and just to cleanse me from my sin from all unrighteousness. Now he's moved me all the way from there to being a son of God and living completely different than that. 
Isn't it? How do you read the scriptures? Now he says you can't. What do you mean I can't? Because I'm not under the law. Been crucified with Christ. Been raised with Christ. The same spirit that raised him from the dead also quickened my mortal body. What do you say? Right. Hallelujah! Amen. You know, I'm telling you, the church has a lot to shout about. What a redeemer. What a marvelous God we have. What I want to say to you is this. If all these people live their life in church and have theologians and pastors teaching them forever that they're sinners, then why would you ever judge that person or condemn that person or find fault with that person if they did all the sins every week? Why would you? Because you're telling them every week you're a sinner. Well, what would you expect a child to do if you say that by the time their child or their adulthood until they get to be old? What would you think you should do? I'm going to sin. I think, my Lord, how many lives have been totally destroyed because they've been taught they're sinners, sinners. Not a new creation. Not free. Jesus said the truth will set you free. Free from what? Free from sin. You know what I can say to you? If a person believes they're a sinner, they do not have confidence. Because God's love gives us this awareness that we have a clear conscience and the only thing that cleanses is the blood of the Lamb. That's why people keep going back and confessing, 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 just like Patrick Nolan or Dolan. That's great.